Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay. This is part two of our sort of sort of a weekly roundup anywhere. We talk about a bunch of topics. Uh, part one, if you haven't watched it, is kind of about Trump and the Republican Party. And we talked a lot about systemic corruption, deep corruption, not just in the Trump organization, but in that whole political stratum around the Republican Party. And we also mentioned, you have a similar thing goes on at the much of the higher echelons of the corporate Democratic Party. Um, and one of the things that I personally think is, uh, it, it, it's not corruption because it's legal, but it's sort of borderline corruption, I think, is, is how so much of the funding of the Democratic Party affects the policy, particularly in its attitude towards Israel. And uh, one, you know, it goes, it goes beyond normal strategic thinking about Israel and the United States. Sometimes it goes into full prostration uh, in front of, uh, I think, uh, I will use the word, I'm not a congresswoman, so I won't get, no one will care what I say. But yeah, it's about the Benjamins. Uh, there's a lot of enormous funding uh, that comes from Wall Street particularly, but also from the entertainment sector and you know, Chaim Saban, who is about, you're about to see, is on stage with Nancy Pelosi when she's about to prostrate herself. Um, and Chaim Saban is one of the billionaires that's a major funder of the Democratic Party and certainly pushes the Democratic Party towards a, a kind of almost uncritical uh, support for Israel. I'm not saying everyone in the Democratic Party is on that page, uh, but much of the leadership is. Uh, same way Sheldon Adelson pushes the Republican Party and helped finance Trump coming to power, uh, I don't think there's any accident that the, Trump moved the American embassy in Israel to Jerusalem. That was one of the demands of Sheldon Adelson. Maybe he, he might have wanted to do it anyway. But uh, to think that the money from some of these uh, Jewish billionaires is not affecting policy is crazy. It's just fact. It's too obvious, and it's not anti-Semitic to talk about how the funding affects policy. It's no different than the Koch brothers affecting f uh, policy on fossil fuels. And anyway, here's uh, Nancy Pelosi back in December at the Israeli-American Council. Let's, let's run that. If capital crumbled to the ground, the one thing that would remain is our commitment to our aid, and I don't even call it aid, our cooperation with Israel, because that's fundamental to who we, fundamental uh, to who we are. If the capital, meaning Washington, D.C., crumbled to the ground, we would still support Israel. It's, it's so fundamental to who we are. Um, but I, she's, I hope, speaking for the Democratic Party there. Um, at any rate, now joining me to talk about this and some other issues to do with the Democratic Party, First of all, in the studio, Jacqueline Lukeman is editor-in-chief of Lukeman Nation, a social media outlet, and a regular now contributor on The Real News Network. Thanks. And Jeff Cohen is the founder of Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting, and he's the co-founder of RootsAction.org. Uh, thank you both for joining us, thanks joining for, us again. Thanks for having uh, Jeff, start with you. What, what, what do you make of, well, one, what Pelosi said, which is even kind of over... over the line of outrageousness, even for leading Democrats. Uh, but what do you make of this deep relationship between Chaim Saban and others um, and, and the Democratic Party? Well, uh, Congresswoman Ilhan Omar from Minnesota has been attacked for having the temerity to suggest that targeted big funding has something to do with pushing politicians to express their undying allegiance to Israel. And you just witnessed in that clip Nancy Pelosi doing it. Other leading Democrats do it. Uh, when Nancy Pelosi makes that comment, she's seated next to Chaim Saban, who has said, I have one issue. He's a big Democratic donor, one of the biggest. I have one issue, and that's protecting Israel, period. And so uh, the, the lunacy of Washington is that Ilhan Omar got into trouble for saying something that everyone knows it's true. And that's this, that the Israel right or wrong fanaticism of the Democratic Party leadership especially uh, is out of control and it has something to do with the funding. Uh, Chaim Saban 
uh, once, I think he donated about $10 million to build the offices for the Democratic National Committee in Washington, D.C. So, I mean, what, what's interesting to me is the debate that's finally happening about Palestinian rights and does the Israel right or wrong lobby have too much power in Washington over both parties. It's an, a, a debate that only happened because a number of people ran within the Democratic Party, as much as people find that distasteful, and they won. So you have uh, Rashida Tlaib, a Palestinian American, a Muslim woman, uh, first uh, Palestinian American woman elected to Congress from Detroit, Ilhan Omar uh, from Minnesota, Alexandria Ocasio Cortez, a Congresswoman from New York City, and they're all wanting to discuss Palestinian rights. And, and they're not being, going to be intimidated by saying uh, this comment was over the edge or you implied dual loyalty. So it's fascinating to see this real divide. It's exciting for someone like me, a Jewish American, who's been trying to generate debate about the U.S. blind support for Israel despite any human rights violations that's gone on for decades. And I've been doing this for decades. We're finally getting somewhere because these young women of color have gotten elected to Congress. Well, I think that's exactly why Pelosi went so overboard, Jacqueline, because of ex you can see the rising tide within the Democratic Party. You can see, especially in the uh, sections that are supporting all the progressives, not the least of which is the Sanders uh, campaign, but right. all the others. Mm -hmm. And there's clearly a, a shift. And when, when, when Pelosi says it's fundamental to who we are, She's no longer speaking. I mean, I'm not sure it ever was, but she's not speaking for the majority of the Democratic Party, I don't no. think, anymore. No, she's, she's, she's not. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, Jack, Jeff? go ahead. Yeah. yeah, I'll just say one other. Yeah, go ahead. She's not speaking for most Jews anymore. Right. And, you know, Pew does this polling of Jewish American attitudes toward Israel. And the younger you are as a Jewish American, the more distanced you are and the more concerned you are about Israeli behavior. So... Uh, again, there's, there's uh, wealthy uh, money uh, from the Chaim Sabans and the Adelson that goes to both parties, and those donors happen to be Jewish. But among middle-class Jews, there's a lot of questioning going on, increasing questioning going on of uh, U.S. support, blind support for Israel. And I think it's really important when she's saying, with Sabam sitting there and, and sections of Wall Street listening, Mm -hmm. Fundamental to who we are means we, the leaders of the Democratic Party, right. no matter what happens mm -hmm. with these Cong new Congress people or whatever happens, you know, with outside in the the movement, we're going to make sure the Democratic Party doesn't change on this. Exactly. I mean, she went on further to say, as I think it was a reporter in Mondo Weiss, uh, that she told the same group of people, listen, I know we've got a few new people in our party who are saying things and they're pushing for this ridiculous two-state solution, um, to which members of the audience at this gathering booed when she said, or they jeered when she said two-state solution. And she told them, you know, look, the extreme left in our party, just ignore them. So... She is sitting on this stage in front of uh, a group of very moneyed, single-issue uh, donors, and their single issue is not justice for people of color, black people in the United States. It's not free college tuition. It's not environmental justice. It's not... Obviously, it's not getting money out of politics, right? So... If everything else in this country burns to the ground because of all of these other issues that the Democratic base is supposedly um, being uh, fought on behalf of by their party, we can all die. But as according to Nancy Pelosi, who the Democratic Party is, is they will continue with their aid and coordination with, uh, uh, for Israel. To heck with the rest of us. We can all just burn to the ground. Now, this was a, this didn't get a, a lot of attention when it happened, but because of the the high profile criticism and unfair criticism of uh, Representative Omar and Representative Tlaib and uh, uh, Representative Ocasio Cortez, this kind of thing is going to get more attention. And Pelosi 
and Democrats like her are not going to be able to uh, survive under the weight of this issue. This is the Democrat. This is one of the Democratic Party's uh, issues that they can't sustain under the weight, to sustain themselves under the weight. Uh, Jeff, I think it's very important in this con whole conversation to recognize that while not all criticism of Israel is anti-Semitism, some is. And as you can see what's happening in the Labour Party, and I can see it, I mentioned in another interview, even on our own website, mixed in with very legitimate opposition to apartheid in Israel, the occupation, the essentially war crimes against Gaza. But you look in the comments section, bear in that critique, you will find a thread that's out and out racist. You know, just attack on Jews, the Jewish this, the Jewish that. Not critique of Israel, but tying together a really anti-Semitic message. Oh. I, I think it's, let me just give me a sec to finish this. And, and I, I think it's very important to recognize it. And I would say that, that for some of the funders, some of the Wall Street funders, and others, Jewish, uh, Jews that have a lot of money, they see, they can't, you know, they spend most of their day working, you know, whether it's on the, in Wall Street or somewhere else, uh, you know, doing business, making money like anybody else in business does. They're not super political. They don't have super, you know, the kind of conversations we have all the time. And Israel does become for them personally an, a symbol that if you're attacking Israel, you're attacking me as a Jew. And, and, of course, Netanyahu and the Israelis hammer this down the throat of Jews in America that, you know, they're really attacking you as a Jew. It's not really about Israel, when, in fact, mostly it is about Israel. But I think for us, having these kinds of conversations, it's very important, especially for people in the Jewish community in the United States and Canada and the United Kingdom. You know, they need to hear that, no, we do get that there really is anti-Semitism. We do get that there are fascists and racists burrowing themselves in this movement to critique U.S. policy towards the Middle East and to critique Israel. On the other hand, this critique is not an attack on them as Jews, and they're following into a real trap, which leads to horrible foreign policy of the United States, total injustice towards the, for the Palestinian people, and, and I just needed to do that rant. Go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, oh, I agree with you. If you look in the base, if you look in the comment sections, you're going to see that anti-Semitism is alive and well in our country and overseas. There's no doubt about it. But the comments that we're referring to from members of Congress who have been critical of Israel and want to get a debate going about the Israeli occupation have not been that kind of anti-Semitism. They, they've, they've been truthful comments about the power of the Israel right or wrong lobby. They've been truthful comments about how politicians like Nancy Pelosi keep being pushed to express their allegiance to Israel. Those are truthful. Same thing from the British Labor Party leadership truthful criticism of Israeli behavior and actions and subjugation of Palestinians. So, yeah, no one's going to deny that anti-Semitism remains a problem. We just had this shooter in the Pittsburgh synagogue, uh, you know, along with the white supremacists who shoot up African-American churches or in New Zealand uh, shoot up a mosque. Uh, white supremacism is real. And anti-Semitism is real. Jacqueline mentioned something that's really important off the air, which is that there's probably more willingness to debate Israel in the Democratic Party base, even among Jewish Democrats, want to have a debate about Israel's unacceptable actions with regard to Palestinians. But in the Republican Party base, this Christian Zionism the Christian fundamentalism is so pervasive uh, that it in some ways will uh, prevent a debate within the Republican Party more than there will be a debate within the Democratic Party about Israel. And I'm proud to be a Jew who often works in Democratic Party primaries, that that debate is getting louder and louder. And I credit 
these young members of Congress like Rashida Tlaib, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Ilhan Omar, they're not going to be pushed to the side with inaccurate claims, oh, you hate all Jews. Yeah, and, and, I, and I, I'm so glad you brought that, that up because I think people need to understand what this Christian uh, uh, end times prophecy is and why it's so focused on um, this, this unquestioning loyalty uh, uh, with Israel. It is not that these fundamental uh, conservative Christians actually love Jews. That's well, quite really... The, quite the, th the thesis, the, the, the theory is Jews go to hell. <laughs> exactly. So, I mean, if we really want to have a conversation about anti-Semitism, okay, let, let's have a real serious conversation about not just all the other messy and unpleasant uh, theology that's that some guy wrote, that a bunch of guys wrote, that probably are not the words of actual Jesus in the Bible that people continue to follow and get completely wrong and destroy people's lives. But let's really have a conversation about the anti-Semitism in the end times prophecy that so many Christians believe in. And I'm not saying this to beat up on Christians because I am one. So I, I, I grew up in this theology. I, I understand it. I understand that we believe our salvation is tied to Jesus coming back to Jerusalem in Israel as the capital of Israel. But we also believe absolutely incorrectly outside of historical context. And I do not believe this is the truth of the God or the Jesus I serve that Jews who do not uh, uh, believe in Christ, the second coming of Christ as their savior, like you said, they'll go to hell. So, I, I mean, how, how, is that, how is that any kind of a loving uh, cooperation or relationship with the people we're supposed to be giving all this money to to protect? No, it, it, this is in a perverse kind of um, fundamentalist, tyrannical theology that is driven uh, a lot of conservative Republican politics that they, of course, they don't want to talk about this. Well, whether it's on the Jewish side and people like Netanyahu pandering to the Orthodox Jews, and clearly Netanyahu doesn't believe in anything but his own power That's right. and, and greater Israel, but not greater Israel for religious reasons, using religion to justify greater Israel, or the, the, this unholy alliance between the Zionists like Netanyahu and the right-wing Christian evangelicals represented in the, right now in the White House by Vice President Pence, who's a direct representative right. of that trend. Mind you, he's also very closely tied to the Koch brothers. Yes, he is. And there's no reason to think the Koch brothers believe any of this, but it's a great vehicle to manipulate people mm -hmm. with. Mm -hmm. and, and one would hope that Christians could see that none of this has anything to do with the message of Jesus Christ. No, and, and, and I think one of the reasons they can't see is because you, we have to keep in mind that the Christian faith in the United States, and I think in much of the world, is also rooted in the ideology of white supremacy. I mean... And must I add, anti-Semitism. And anti-Semitism. It's rooted in both it of is, those. It is, and we can, we can put sexism in there, we can put homophobia, in, because these are, the, the, there are the words and teachings of Jesus Christ, which I absolutely believe in and are true and try my best to live by. And then there's that, all that other stuff that came from the Council of Nicaea, uh, uh, Nicaean and all these other councils and Constantine. And this was just a bunch of men with political power wanting to use a, a new movement against a very powerful religious organization that was actually kind of in bed with the Roman state um, uh, to, to control everybody else. So when you have people who are, 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 are believing in something that means something very deeply to them that is so steeped in problematic um, and anti-human ideology, that's white supremacy and, and anti-Semitism, it's really hard to get through to these people because they believe their ex existential uh, salvation, their existential reward outside of this world comes from believing in this really flawed ideology. And it's, it's, it was hard for me to, to look at the history and realize, oh, this is stuff that men did. This was not what Jesus said. If you, you go back to the Democratic Party, the uh, comments of 
and then Omar and, you know, it's about the Benjamins. I think she had to apologize for that, which I, I thought there was absolutely no reason she should have apologized for that, because clearly it is a lot about money, and that's what she meant by Benjamins. Um, how this, this uh, now, but a lot of people stood up for her, and uh, a lot of the, the new progressive members of Congress stood up for her. And it, Jeff, is this a, a, a real crack now? Like, I don't know, just a few years ago, uh, Netanyahu came and actually embarrassed Obama, or tried to, and uh, Congress gave him, what was it, 27 standing ovations when he speaks in Congress, and he's not even invited by the White House, he was invited by the Republican Party, and how many Democrats stood up over and over and over again, you know, to prostrate themselves in front of, in front of Netanyahu, well, now you got some Dems who are saying, no, we're, we're, we're not going to jump on that. It, it's, a, it's a really, it's amongst many things with these new pe people in Congress, it's a fascinating development. Well, and I think if they had not been elected to Congress, that's why I believe that progressive socialists should run in Democratic primaries where you can win. If they hadn't been elected to Congress, this debate wouldn't be happening. If, if a number of them, uh, AOC from New York, we wouldn't be having a debate about the Green New Deal. I mean, there's all sorts of debates that are happening within the Democratic Party. Pelosi is an Israel right or wrong fanatic. Pelosi den denigrates the Green New Deal. She refers to it the green, the green dream or whatever they call it. And, uh, but, but what's exciting to me is there is a resurgence in the progressive wing of the Democratic Party and all of these debates are happening because of the success of these people getting elected. And at rootsaction.org, we're rallying around these Congress members because we suspect they are going to be primary. In fact, allies of APAC talked openly in a New York Times uh, article that they were going to come after Ilhan Omar in Minnesota. So for those of us at rootsaction.org, we're ready to go to the defense and raise money for these Congress members that are bold enough to question things like actually doing something on climate change, Medicare for all, Palestinian rights. It's an exciting time, I think, for progressives within the Democratic Party and without. Okay, well, we're going to end this one here. Thanks very much for joining us, Jacqueline. Thanks, Jeff. And thank, thank you, you for joining us on The Real News Network.